Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Dave Coplin. Hello, everybody. Thanks for that great invitation. For, oh, sorry, you said hello. I wasn't expecting that. It's fantastic. I remember. I'm not in London anymore. I'm outside London. People talk to you. This is wonderful. Hi, I'm Dave. I work for a company. Hi again, thank you. Uh, my mum's in. Um, I work for a company called Microsoft, and I have a comedy job title. Oh, yeah. Because I am Microsoft UK's chief envisioning officer. Check me out. Job titles are important at Microsoft. That's why I invented mine about five years ago, because I have a special job for our company. I work for a company that you well know loves to talk to you about the technology and the products that we make. We love that stuff. But what we don't do enough of, for my money, is not talk about the technology, but talk about the human beings that use it. So my job is to think thoughtfully about the future, project out in the future, to understand how a human being is going to want to live, work, and play. Because I think if we understand what the human beings are going to want to do, we can be a lot more mindful about the technology they're going to require. So then, understand, at a certain level, my job is essentially about the future of humanity, right? And I just figured if I'm going to have a job that's about the future of humanity, I deserve, nay, I demand a job title with a certain degree of pomposity. <laughs> Think you'll see I've achieved that. It actually started out as a joke. The danger is five years in now, I'm starting to believe it's real, so you'll have to keep me real. Um, I have to give you a bit of background to who I am. I stand in front of you, an individual who's dedicated his entire career to the world of IT. 25 years in the IT industry. 25 years in the smallest rooms in your organization with no natural daylight, just the whirring of the fans and the flickering of those LEDs to keep me company. Right? I'm all right. I have chosen to work for one of the world's largest technology companies. I have gone to the extremes of personal grooming to grow a beard and a ponytail. That's how committed I am. And guess what? I also quite like Star Trek. Now, the comedy for me, normally I would put up a slide here showing my eighth birthday party. So this is me when I was seven, I was always into Star Trek. This is how into Star Trek I am. That's my nine-year-old son. At last year's Star Trek convention. That poor kid, he's screwed, right? <laughs> Absolutely screwed. But the thing is, Star Trek's really important, right? When you're a young, naive, gullible kid like what I am and like what he is, Star Trek teaches this really important lesson that technology is supposed to be a force for good in your lives. It's supposed to be something that enables human beings to rise up and achieve more than they could do on their own. This is why I chose a career in IT. This is why I choose to work for Microsoft. But my problem, my problem is those 25 years in IT. Because I look around at how we all use technology today and I don't see this liberating force. I see a prison. I see something that constrains how we think, controls how we work. And quite frankly, I refuse to accept that as our future. Three years ago, I came to you and I talked to you about a book I'd written called Business Reimagined. This is about how the way we work today doesn't work. And we talked about how to break free from the office, how to get technology in the right place. Last year, I came to talk to you about the rise of the humans. This was another book I'd written about our personal relationship with technology, and in particular, the power that data will bring. This year, I'm a bit late. I'm halfway through writing the book. The irony for me is the third book is a book about productivity. This is a book that I am now four weeks late in producing. <laughs> Anybody spot the irony there? Fantastic. But this is all about productivity, and productivity is possibly the most boring topic in the world. And yet it is crucial because everything we do in our lives depends on us getting it right. So why productivity? Well, productivity is one of the biggest challenges that faces the UK today, certainly the UK economy. If you paid attention to some of the economic debate for last month's general election, you'll have heard that the UK's productivity growth is at its lowest in 60 years. Since the end of the Second World War, we are now slumbering in terms of how productive we are as a nation. Compared to our colleagues in the G7, we rank second from bottom when it comes to productivity. The UK is at its least productive ever. And the problem I have with this is not the result. It's our definition of productivity. Because I would argue, in fact, let me ask you, how many of you are living the life of Riley? How many of you are actually busier now than you've ever been in your entire lives or careers? What a surprise, we all feel this. Because the issue about productivity is productivity has been turned into some macroeconomic term, it's output per unit of input. And when you do that, you stop thinking about the real promise of productivity, which is the output, and instead you think about the process. And the reason we think about this process is mostly down to this guy, Frederick Taylor. This is not a picture of Frederick Taylor. I'd love to think that it was. He probably was a bit cooler. If he'd existed as a 1970s geography teacher, he may have looked like this. But Frederick Taylor was basically the guy that said, everything you do at work 
is a standard process. And every standard process has an allotted time. And if we improve the time for the process, we can improve the rate at which we are productive. We can make more products more quickly than ever before. And so then we start to focus on what productivity means in the industrialized nations. It's about the process of work. But underneath that, it's actually about time. It's about how quickly we work. But the real issue comes in how we as a society evolved in the Middle Ages, because something really important happened to our relationship with time and productivity in that time. In the Middle Ages, if I was some weaver sat out in the valleys weaving my cloth, the only thing I really cared about was how much my family needed to eat and what I needed to buy for my family. And I would wake up when the sun rose, I would weave my cloth, and I would make enough cloth to sell me to feed my family and get me things that I need. And the Industrial Revolution comes along. And then actually, I'm no longer selling my cloth to, to my customers, I'm selling my cloth to the people who own the mills. And now I'm not selling cloth, I'm selling time. And it was actually the Benedictine monks who started to push time into our societies, because they decide, decided, excuse me, <clears throat> that if the monks were too idle, the devil would find work for their idle hands. So they started to toll the bells when it was time for lunch, when it was time for prayer, when it was time for work, when it was time to wake up, when it was time to sleep. And the noise of the bells transcended the monasteries and into the villages. And slowly, bit by bit, our society began to be oriented by the clock. So much so that some people would argue that the most important invention, the most important machine of the Industrial Revolution was not the spinning jenny, was not what steam engine, it was actually the clock because it was the clock by which we synchronized our lives. Some of you may or may not know that it's only within the last hundred years that we've actually standardized our time. We used to have rail operators in this country who all had their own definition of standard time. They all ran on their own version of time. Some of them still do to this very day. <laughs> but the real issue when we come into synchronized living is it starts to place a value on our own time. And there are a couple of things that are starting to come together. First of all, our society has changed. Our very definition of working and living has changed. And whether it's people who want to become more engaged as parents, spend more time with their family, or the very nature that we now have technology that supports us working at different times of day, we now as a society have far less time available than ever before. And we get to a place where Ben Franklin, he told us a long time ago, he told us that time is money. I don't think time is money anymore. I think time is worth more than money. Think about your own personal lives. What would you give to have more time available to do the things that you're interested, be they in work or outside of work? So we're in this place where we're working harder than ever before. Well, I hope by now some of you are thinking, well, hang on a minute, long-haired beardy bloke on the stage. You work for an industry that was supposed to fix all of this. Isn't technology supposed to be the solution? You came to our workplace, you came to the way we work, you were supposed to take all this pain away. How come over 30 or 40 years of the personal computer entering our workplace, we now have less time, we are more busy than ever before? Well, the real issue is not the technology. And I would say that, wouldn't I? The real issue is how we use the technology. The real issue is the fact that most of our working practices are based on a world before technology existed. Most of the ways our organizations, our governments work, are based on Victorian working practices, processes that were put in place at the turn of the century. And the challenge is today, we haven't changed those processes. We use technology to do those processes quicker. So we're doing the same old stuff a bit quicker than before. And the easiest example I can give you is email. Email is a wonderful thing. It should be a wonderful thing. But email, email is just a digitization of an old analog process we had called office memos. Do you remember this? In the world before computers, if I wanted to send a message to you and you were in the office, what would I do? I'd go to the stationery cupboard. I'd grab a piece of paper. I'd scratch out your name, scratch out my name, scratch out the message, stuff it in an envelope, and it would get sent to you. What do we do with that process? We came along. The genius is in IT. We digitized that process, man. We made it fast, we made it efficient, we made it cheap. Who amongst you does not get enough email today? That's how good we are, right? Because what we did with that process, we digitized it. We took an old-fashioned process, a process that was created in a time where technology did not exist, not as a concept. Nobody understood what it could do. And we made that process work quicker. We never once for a moment said, you know what? Maybe there's a different way we could communicate. Maybe there's a different way we could collaborate. So we're left in a place where the workers cannot work smarter. The only thing left for the workers to do is work harder. So why don't workers work harder? Why can we not expect more from the people in the workplace? 
Well, it's all about engagement. This, not productivity, is the critical issue facing the UK workforce. It's facing, actually, the global workforce because the majority of people at work are disengaged, not really that bothered about what they do. Do you remember know the, the average number in the UK? 83% of the UK workforce is disengaged. These are the people who represent your organization. These are the people who work with you, who are delivering your dreams when it comes to what you stand for as an organization. But they're not bothered. And we have to fix that, because if we want to get to a place where technology can do what we need to, engagement is the door that opens it. Would have been helpful if I clicked the slide, wouldn't it? Never mind. So what do we need to do? Well, I think we have to change our view on what productivity is. And I get that productivity is a really, really dull word. But productivity is not just what we do at work. Productivity is what we do every minute of our waking day. It's how we make best use of everything that's available to us to deliver the kind of experiences that we want, be it at work or outside. One of the reasons I work for Microsoft is because that's our job. Our job is to help you with productivity. And again, I know some of you will be sensing the irony that here's the guy you know, who gives you Microsoft Office complaining about the fact that you have too much email. I get that. Well, actually, we need to evolve. We need to think differently about what the technology is going to deliver. Our mission statement as an organization, this is our CEO, a guy called Sachin Nadella, is to reinvent productivity. That's the dull bit. But it's actually about empowering every single person on the planet to achieve more in their life with technology. This is not about using Word quicker, doing better slides in PowerPoint. This is about using technology in a very different way. So what we've done is we've created a vision of what we think productivity means. And this is one of those futuristic videos about what the world's going to look like. But I want you to look at the video really, really closely, because there will be a test. thinking, well, that's all just science fiction, isn't it? You know what? You're absolutely right. All that stuff is made up, except for one thing. The guys who put that video together have one single design premise with the video, which is that they can only show a technology concept if that concept exists today in our labs. 
Now, these are not product promises. We're not going to make specifically these things, but many of the things that you saw will be how we will work in the future. Let me pick on a few examples. Uh, holograms are all the rage. So this whole concept of uh, you know, being able to see virtual worlds, being able to blend the virtual and the real world. We have a product called HoloLens. All of these products essentially involve a dorky headset, right? And we'll show you some brilliant video of lots of people wearing dorky headsets in the office. Never going to happen. Right? But what the holograms do enable us to interact with the world in a way that's very, very different. And where we're going is a world where actually dorky headsets will no longer be required. But we have to start getting ready for that. We're also used to the concept of video conferencing. Video conferencing today is a bit of a painful experience. The camera's stuck in the worst possible place, normally above, shining down the backlight from my forehead, normally glares back, right, and become very self-conscious. What happens in a world where we have high empathy presence, where actually we convert the entire wall or the entire surface to be a display that we can interact with? All of these things are coming. Our challenge now is how do we get ready for that? How do we get ready for a world that opens the potential of that technology? Because if that technology becomes available to us, and all we choose to do with it is to stuff it on our laptops or tablets, which we then transport from home to the office, we've kind of missed the point. So this is actually a story about transformation. And I know Cliff's going to talk to you a bit later on, in fact, just after me, about what business transformation means. But to me, it means starting with the end. It means starting with the outcome. What is it that you're actually trying to achieve? Not the process. Forget about Taylor. Forget about what he told you about how you get to the outcome. Think about what does the outcome mean. And when you sit on the outcome, you can start to peel back. On a and based on a digital society, what can I do today to deliver that process, to deliver that outcome in a different way? But if you're going to do that, you have to think very differently. Because the challenge we have as adults is we typically want to repeat our past experiences. So when we look at the outcome, when we look at a problem, the way we want to solve it is using the things that we've done in the past. This is why email has become such of a problem, because we replace that way with our old way of working. What you need to do now is to start being transformative on your thinking. When you look at the thing that you're trying to do, start asking yourself, how does technology enable us to do this differently? And that's really, really hard because that process, the past experiences, shoves us down the wrong path quite often. Let me give you my favorite example. I want to talk to you about the opportunity cost of thinking in a transformative way, the opportunity cost of innovation. I'm going to use the example of driverless cars. You'll be familiar with these. These are the cars that are going to be doing the rounds, I think, in Milton Keynes as part of the UK's experiment with driverless cars. Some really important things you need to know about driverless cars. I'll give you some statistics, first of all. Uh, basically, the numbers that we're looking at right now show that by the year 2040, 50% of all miles driven on any road around the world will be done by an autonomous vehicle. By 2070, that will become 100%. So we will be at 100% autonomous vehicles by 2070? Seriously? That far away? And then do you know what the first law that the UK has passed for driverless cars? Anyone know what the first law is? That in a driverless car on a UK road, they have to employ the services of an individual called the driver who has to sit in the front of the driverless car, monitoring all of the dashboard, everything, just in case something goes wrong. Anybody spot a problem with that, maybe? Anybody remember our red flag law from the turn of the 19th century? If was when automobiles first turned up on the road, it was law to have a man carrying a red flag standing in front of your vehicle, constraining the speed of the vehicle to the pace of a walking human being. Right? This is the challenge. But we see, we think driverless cars are the answer because we're looking straight ahead. We're thinking about where we've been. We know where we are today, and we plot a straight line between them. And that ends us up telling us that we're going to have driverless cars. But innovation is not a straight line. Innovation is much more random. We need to think differently because I don't want driverless cars in 2070. If in 2070, if we still think the car is the right way to travel around, we have missed the point. But we're never going to see that because the opportunity cost of innovation puts all our focus here. We should instead be thinking about, why don't we have some of these? That would be cool. And just, you know, hang on a minute, let's not stop at hoverboards. What we really should have is one of these. That's the kind of transportation I want in 20. But we'll never think about this because we're too busy thinking about how we replicate the car 100 odd years from now. Transformative thinking. That's the bit that we have to get into. That's the thing where we will find the answers for the future that we want to build. And then there's this thing back to engagement. And the biggest challenge we face inside our organizations is the disengagement of our employees. Our employees lack purpose. Now, we cannot give them purpose. I cannot force employees to care. 
but it's in how we frame the question, how we give them what it is that we mean to do. And there's this lovely mythical story, business story, told in many an MBA course about JFK, the American president, when he turned up to the NASA science program in the 60s. And he talks a story of organizational purpose, because he's walking around NASA and he sees the guys on the production line and they're soldering components. And he goes to the first guy and he says, what are you doing? I said, well, what the hell? You're the president, I'm soldering a joint. It's pretty obvious what I'm doing. Goes to the next guy, what are you doing? The guy says, I'm earning $5 an hour. And on his way out, JFK spots the janitor, says to the janitor, what are you doing? And the janitor turns to him and says, I'm helping to put man on the moon. Now, I don't care whether that story is true or not. It's a great example of the power of purpose. You need to make sure that the people in your organization, no matter how big your organization is, they know why you exist, what your purpose is. Because when they understand your purpose, they will do everything within their gift to deliver against that purpose if they agree to it. And what you need is everybody empowered with that purpose. It's funny, I used to be a management consultant. Yeah, I know, how, bad, how much worse could it be, right? And we used to have this horrible phrase. When we got dropped into some poorly performing project team, we used to have this really horrible, arrogant phrase that only management consultants have. We'd turn up and we'd see this badly performing project team, we'd think, it's like a bunch of five-year-olds playing football, you know, because there would be the ball and there'd be 22 screaming kids all running around the ball. Turns out, that's actually not a bad way to run an organization. If the ball is your purpose and everybody's doing everything they can to deliver against it, what do you think is going to happen? Sooner or later, you're going to score. You're going to get to where you need to be because people are empowered. They are able to make a difference in what they do. And then there's really your relationship with technology. And I've talked to you for three years now about your personal relationship with technology. I've talked to you about mindfulness. I've talked to you about the crucial 21st century skill, which is about uh, making the right decisions about when to use technology and when to not use technology. I want to talk to you about some, just some things that you might want to try for productivity. Just two things. Number one is email is actually your friend, not your enemy but it's up to you to make sure that you use it in the right way. The problem with email is we use email as a bucket today and we hide our knowledge away. There's a guy called Bill French has a wonderful quote about email. He says, email is where knowledge goes to die. Because if you think about it, once you get an email, that stuff stays in. Nobody else can read that stuff. Once it's in your inbox, it's waiting on you. You're the bottleneck. So find different ways to use it. Do two things. Number one, if the thing isn't confidential or private, then why are you using email at all? You should be using some other tool to communicate that. <laughs> Secondly, one of the biggest habits we have to break at work is the use of email to mop up our spare time. We all do it. Every time you get five minutes to yourself, what do you do? Oh, I just got to have a quick look at email. Email is a black hole. The minute you step into the black hole of email, you never know when you will ever come out because you will never, ever get to the bottom of the black hole of email. Instead, you need to start time-boxing email. Set some time, some specific time, once or twice a day, and that is the only time when you do email. And when you do that, all of a sudden, email starts to work for you because you realize that the real challenge with email is not the email service itself, it's the buggers that send them, and it includes you. So you find a different approach to it. And then the second thing, one of the worst sort of uh, perpetrators of challenge in your productivity, the thing that constrains your life, is your diary. And what do you do with your diary? Well, in our digital world, what we do with our diary is we publish it on the network. And we say, hey, here's my diary. If you can find an open spot, help yourself. Fill it. I don't care. And I will blindly go to any meeting I'm invited to. Stop that. Your time is your time. You decide what is a good use of your time. You decide which is the meetings that you should attend and which you shouldn't. Take back control of your diary. And when you do that, you start to be much more economical with your time. You start to make better judgments about your time. You become in control of your own destiny. But the real opportunity with technology, it goes back to a time in the medieval ages where we started to align our lives away from the natural rhythm of the clock and the seasons to the ticking of the clock. The clock now mandates everything we do from the second we get up to the second we go to sleep. Technology allows us the opportunity to step away from that. Technology in all shapes and forms gives us the opportunity to time shift, not just when you watch EastEnders, but when you should work, when you should shop, when you should be with your family. All of these things are within your gift to choose. And that's the final message, is this productivity to me is about making the most of the moments that matter in your life. 
And these can be at work, these can be at home, doesn't matter where they are, but it's your choice. And every single moment is precious to you and you need to make the right choice. Use technology to make the right choice. The funny thing about this slide, I was doing this deck, this is a brand new deck, I'm halfway through the story, and I was stuck for about three hours on this last slide. What should the image, the story is about making moments that matter in your life. What should the image be? So I asked my wife, my wife being my wife, very smart, just in one line, straight away says, should just have a picture of a coffin. Gives you a little glimpse into my wife. <laughs> but it's true, right? It's our lives. The technology is here to serve us, to give us the control, the ability to choose when is it the right moment. The reason that we don't do today is we don't make the right choices and we've not built the right work culture. These are the things that are within all of our gift that we have to change. If we can do that, we can reinvent productivity, we can save ourselves, we can save our organizations, and ladies and gentlemen, we can save the economy. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>